Um, to the first large webinar, um, we may well be joined by one of our guest speakers, Professor Rosato, but we will see what happens in the coming minutes. Um, my name is James Kinross. I'm a surgeon. Um, I'm speaking to you from Imperial College London. Uh, I'm currently sat at St. Mary's Hospital. Um, today in the United Kingdom, we've had 3,269 cases uh, of COVID-19 uh, diagnosed to date, and we've had 144 deaths. To put that into some form of perspective, uh, roughly 16 days ago in Italy, for roughly the same number of cases, and today they've got over 41,000. Um, you uh, will all be very aware of the significant challenge we now face. Um, it doesn't matter what country you're speaking to us from today, um, your healthcare system is going to be severely tested. And although surgery does not necessarily represent uh, um, a core treatment modality for this disease, very obviously, we still have to manage our acute care patients and with acute surgical disease, and we still have to manage the millions of patients with chronic surgical disease. The challenge we have is to have no evidence upon which to make those decisions, uh, and we need one very urgently because there's limited time to prepare. The plans have really been created a pragmatic approach to rapidly expedite best practice and to create a community of surgeons who want to share information. We have a series of that have been set up in real time, and we will discuss those at the end. But a core cool part of this is to bring together experts treating this uh, catastrophe. And we are really humbled, grateful to our colleagues from uh, who are going to speak to us today. Uh, we thank them uh, very much. Um, before we start, um, there have been significant barriers at the moment because everybody's working from home. Uh, we have had some problems with live storm during the day, but I'm, hope it's I'm hoping it's going to be safe to give us. Um, there are some rules to this. Which is, firstly, it is your webinar, which means that we want you to ask questions. Uh, laptop, you will see there is a question, uh, and you can ask and uh, uh, conversations through that. You do this. If you want, we will ask. Um, uh, Professor Castoro and Spinelli as we go, and we want to have some active discussion. Um, we will ask you some polls just to get some where you're listening to this in the world. Uh, speak for no more than an hour because um, our guest speaker's time is very precious. Uh, Um, we also um, request that if you have questions, there is a forum on the pansurge.org website. Uh, please do keep the conversation in the narrative. If you have uh, future webinars you, or questions that you have. Um, so to move on quite quickly, um, we're going to start by asking um, Professor Castoro and Professor Spinelli, who are currently sat in the Humanitas arena, is based outside of Milan, and we would uh, be very grateful if you could start by giving us a brief experience, uh, summary of your experience, uh, and uh, talk through being able to respond to that over the last. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to share our experience with you. We are happy to do, and. Uh, just uh, with time, I think we can start with, with few slides, if you like. So, uh, I am uh, Carlo Castoro and uh, the head of the Upper GI Surgery Division in the Humanitas uh, University Research Hospital. And my friend uh, Antonino Spinelli. Is, Hi, everybody. Yeah, he is the head of the core and rectal surgery division here and also surgery in Humanities University. Uh, if you like, as I already discussed with you before starting this uh, webinar, we can share with you some slides prepared by, by our hospital on how the hospital reacted to, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, so sorry, 
okay. Yes, it will. Okay. Here we are. Can you see it? Do you hear us? Something happened to the yeah, audio. We can, we, can, we can hear you very clearly. Uh, can okay. you hear us? Yes, very uh, clearly. Okay, so yeah. um, we will do our best to, to show you the slides as, Thank you. as, as possible. So here we are. So we, we will do a very quick overview on, on the organization or reorganization of the hospital, starting from working in team with clinician nurses and managers, separate patient flows, find dedicated areas for in hospital for all positive patients, close low priority, priority activities and release surgical, uh, critical surgical resources, manage centrally and evaluate technology, look ahead of at least one week and adapt uh, solutions daily, create checkpoints, reduce flows uh, and interaction with uh, visitors and uh, patients and communicate to all employees and follow expert guidelines. So uh, I suggest we go very quickly through this and I will leave, uh, we will leave you all the, the slides. So just there, there's a lot of written material, so it's possibly easier to, to go through them, through the papers. So uh, professor, professor, just before you go on, I'm not sure if you heard me before, that when the comments come through on the menu, they make a little alarm, which you can silence. There is a, a button at the top of your screen, I think, which you can press, which yeah. will silence the Okay, we will try to, button. to find it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's really good because we, we were having yeah. a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. If it, if we should be able to turn it off. Here, probably. Mute my navigation. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that should fantastic, do. Fantastic. Oh, Thank you. Bravo. Yeah. We are Thank relieved. You. We are relieved. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's good that fun. you'll keep. It's good. So, apologies for the interruption. Please keep going. Yeah. No, at all. So, first step was to set up a crisis team with clear responsibilities. The second one, in. But I, I think, uh, yeah. Carlo. I think that we should a little bit. Uh, comment on this because this is yeah. something that we created uh, completely ex novo. We were not used uh, to have this. It's a crisis team that includes many different professionals, including we also as a hospital are not specialized, do not have expertise in infectious diseases. So we had yeah. to, to put up an infectious disease ex expert together with all the key roles in the emergency department, uh, intensive care medicine, we put together new pneumologists and uh, and definitely also working together with the management of the hospital and they absolutely and they yeah. did a great job and they they actually meet twice a day uh, at nine o'clock and at five o'clock every day just to see uh, how the the day evolves and how the accesses do evolve yeah. and what to do uh, as a you know to to just. Uh, yeah. Can, that's, can you give us an good. idea of uh, the time frame over which you had to achieve that? Yeah. So the, uh, everything started on uh, February 20. We were running, starting a meeting on quality assessment of in uh, in the hospital, and it was in the meeting room. And uh, we suddenly had the, the information that the first patient in uh, in a near area, in, near to the hospital, was positive for COVID-19 infection. And so the meeting was changed in the, in the first crisis team meeting. And then everything started from uh, February 20. And the first decision was during that meeting to start separating the patient flow in the emergency department because everything from the beginning was clear that the, an enormous number of patients would uh, potentially come to the emergency department. Because in the beginning, the reaction was uh, still, and in the first days, in the first phase, we had 
we had really a lot of hope that we would have been able yeah. to uh, to really contain these within a few centers around right. the city and we really we are 60 kilometers away from the from the first center and we were hoping for like a week that we would be able to do that so yeah. while the epidemiologists were attempting to find patient zero and to reconstruct the history of the focus um, we actually used that time in order to try to create uh, a path that was uh, that would take into account the possibility that we as well as all other hospitals in the region would have to contribute to this even if as said as a tradition we are not a specialized center for infectious disease right but we have an emergency department and so we are open to yeah, yeah. okay right. just to give you an idea that during this first phase uh, it was decided that four icu beds in a separate area should have been dedicated to possible COVID-19 patients and now we are three weeks later the okay. hospital, we have 48 dedicated beds in the ICU area in different parts of the hospital we will we will open the 40 within the week and unfortunately 48 so yeah so, so things happen very quickly and um, I, I, I do have interrupt yeah. I think the presentation I do, you to, do you want to continue with your presentation yeah. and then maybe we have questions at the end no i, I mean well, well, however you like you. Well, okay. you i think i think that would be good no, so vedo uno schermo nero dove c'è scritto sì okay yeah right. so if, i would continue going through the slides because i think the audience would be very keen to see these okay so so separate patient flow, then find dedicated areas in the hospital for positive patients like ICU and the uh, ward. Yeah, the thing is that we didn't have, as said, the uh, negative pressure words. No. So uh, we uh, just at the very, very beginning with the organization uh, of the, um, with our uh, chief of the operation, they tried to establish which uh, of our words could have been re re um, dedicated re-engineered yeah re-engineered for a negative pressure system and they first uh, re uh, prepared one then two words then three then four yeah. then five then six and so on so that was a conversion even of all the structure itself of the hospital just to tell you that two weeks ago we had a hospital uh, mm -hmm. that is actually not even resembling the one we have today absolutely and it's completely a new hospital unfortunately yeah you so had to that's... physically construct or build new spaces or is it a reorganization of the yeah. assets you have yeah reorganization uh, and some structural change inside the old hospital no, no, not new buildings there's not just a, a tent outside the yeah. hospital for triage of uh, patients yeah the the san raffaele hospital where professor rosati works yeah. they actually are really constructing a new uh, area of intensive it. care outside of the hospital maybe professor rosati can comment that I have to join us shortly and then and then we will ask him okay okay, okay then we go yeah. on so um we had we had this we have this tent which are called which are used for the so-called pre-triage all patients accessing the hospital or the emergency room have to have a pre-triage uh they will be asked first if they have at the very beginning they will they would be asked to where they come from because we were still hoping that uh isolating the focus of that region that had the first patient would have led to a limitation of the and to to limit the risk factors but then once the uh, the epidemic became clear first and then before it had it would have been uh, declared as pandemic as pandemic for from who we uh, stopped obviously to ask this because every patient is a suspect patient in that uh, in regard of uh, where he comes from because the contacts were so many and uh, now the patients are, are only screened for temperature uh, 
yeah. and are, are asked whether they have had fever two weeks before their access. From the first point, we stopped um, visitors to uh, be able, be allowed to even bring patients for or accompany patients for elective surgery, cancer surgery that was right. still going, and um, and even for outpatient clinic. Also, yes, even for outpatient clinics. So the, the patient are coming alone after the entrance of the hospital, inside the hospital. And in Italy, usually they are used to yeah. come in three and four if they come for <laughs> yes. cancer. Absolutely, yes. It's also very difficult to, from a psychological point of view for the patients. So, but the, the crucial um, activity is to separate patient presenting with suspected pulmonary infection with all the other emergency. And also a dedicated area for x-rays and uh, CT scan has been totally dedicated to suspected or positive patients. Right now we have an update of today that um, from starting from today, we will uh, get uh, a test for COVID to all patients uh, accessing the, the ER. Yeah. That was uh, because the, um, the prevalence of positive patients is so high that uh, we, will, uh, we will need to know this, even to know better and to be able to guess or to speculate about the evolution of those cases yeah. once they access the hospital for other causes as well. This has been yes. very controversial in the UK, and we still have problems with that. Um, um, yeah. my, my question is, Is um, are you testing your staff as part of this process, and how often does that happen? No. Okay. So, the question is, if we are testing the staff, I can see you, I can hear you, you can hear me, but uh, you cannot watch me. The camera is uh, enabled, by, but uh, you cannot watch me. It, Professor Pazzati, we can hear you very well, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have Professor um, Bonelli, who is just currently giving uh, his overview. Yeah, I, I, fall, I followed you, I could Perfect. see you, okay? Wonderful. We will, we will bring you into the conversation as we go, and thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, sorry, Professor Castora, we were just, you were just in, in terms yeah, of... Yeah, so the, sorry, the question is if we tested all the healthcare professionals in the hospitals, and the, the answer is no, because policy, uh, national policy, also WHO guidelines, do not currently suggest to test all the all people working in the hospital. It's really controversial, I think, because of the paradoxically, what we are seeing now is that the safest area for uh, all the doctors and nurses is the COVID-19 positive area. And the other part of the hospitals is uh, possibly has a higher risk uh, of uh, being uh, or become positive for us. So yeah, we, because we, so we also, surgeons. Yeah, with so many surgeons, and, and also because we have a limited, uh, definitely a limited uh, personal uh, protection equipment uh, for the rest of the hospital. Obviously, we are not uh, allowed to have um, yeah. the, the filtered masks outside of the COVID areas for for reasons of uh, availability. So at the end of the day, uh, the hospital decided. Uh, to uh, give a mask to every individual accessing the hospital, uh, if he, whether it's a patient, it's a doctor, or whatever other healthcare professional that uh, does it. So just to because uh, to really uh, diminish the possibility of having a contagion, intra-hospital contagion, if everyone wears a mask, even yeah. if it's not a specific FFP3 mask, it's still that everyone, surgical that, yeah, a surgical mask is still effective if, if from everybody used. Thank you. Um, if Professor Rosati in at this conversation, uh, Professor Rosati, could you just please give us a, a, a very top line overview of the situation um, at your hospital? 
Yeah, the situation is uh, a mess as uh, in humanitas. And uh, let's start of uh, what we have normally. And normally we have three ICU units. One is a general ICU of eight beds. One is a neurosurgical ICU of uh, six beds. And one is a cardiovascular ICU of 14 beds. So a total of 28. Due to this emergency, um, uh, we could uh, manage to uh, equip other, other areas, so uh, operating rooms that were not uh, used anymore and other spaces in old operative blocks, and we have doubled the number. So at this moment, uh, we have 56 beds uh, fully equipped, and uh, uh, unfortunately, almost all of them full. Then uh, we are uh, constructing in the sport tennis court, the indoor tennis court of the sporting area of the hospital, two other ICU units, each one of 14 more beds and one of 10 more beds. So there will be uh, other 24 beds and uh, those will be ready on Monday. They have started last Tuesday and they will be ready next Monday. Uh, I don't know if this will be enough because uh, it's sufficient to open new beds and you will have new patients. Uh, a part of this, and this is the, let's say, ICU area just for the intubated patients. A part of this, there have been uh, equipped uh, uh, more or less 200 beds uh, that were initially beds for uh, or, or, orthopedics, uh, nephrology, internal medicine, and they have all been converted in COVID patients' beds. Uh, and those is for patients uh, that need uh, CPAP or BPAP, uh, but not yet intubation. And uh, patients that are uh, still uh, with the high fever, but uh, that, that, that cannot, uh, that don't need yet uh, ventilatory support. So th this is what we, uh, we could uh, uh, put on field now. Uh, the access area through the emergency department is exactly superimposable uh, on uh, what uh, my friends have described. So they have separate uh, uh, lines, uh, separate access line for patients with respiratory symptoms uh, and so from the pre-triage they go and they have a dedicated line and a ded dedicated uh, track to follow, but this is uh, a problem. Uh, second problem is uh, patients that are totally asymptomatic, but uh, with uh, uh, CAT scan signs of bilateral pneumonia. And uh, th this is a real mess. We have uh, accepted some patients from other hospital, uh, mainly from the Bergamo area, and patients that were absolutely asymptomatic, 98% uh, saturation of uh, oxygen. And uh, they, they came in and uh, as a first step, we we brought them to the dedicated CAT scan uh, facility and they did a CAT scan and this was uh, a mess. So this is the other part. Patients that uh, do have and uh, are, are not identified as COVID patients. We, we've certainly had a similar experience and we've, I think by the middle of this week, we had about 10, 10 patients admitted to the surgical take with CT scans that were diagnosed as COVID lung, but actually their PCR was negative. Um, yeah. 
I have I, I have a lot of questions, but I, I did say at the beginning that this is a webinar for the people that are viewing, and there are a lot of questions coming through for you. Um, I just want to get um, to ask some of these questions, and I'm going to start by asking about surgical questions because you are surgeons, and, and this is really a, a surgical forum. So um, I will start with Professor Rosati. Can you give me, please, a sense of the um, type of acute surgery you're doing, if any, and the sort of volumes of acute surgical patients you're seeing? Uh, in, in this moment, uh, everything has been slowed down since last Monday. Uh, so, elective surgery did already have a strong contraction over the last two weeks, and uh, each of us had uh, more or less 50% of the scheduled activity that was cancelled. Uh, but we could operate uh, still uh, in a, a slowing down by almost regular way while there was one uh, emergency room open for everything. We had to stop this, uh, let's say, for example, my unit has normally 14 operating sessions per week and uh, we, we were uh, cut down to eight uh, since last Monday, but since Tuesday, we had, a, a, we had to stop planning elective surgery, even, of course, in cancer patient, uh, patient with uh, a new adjuvant already completely, etc. And there, uh, they, they were open two uh, emergency uh, room, one for non-COVID and one for COVID patients. And uh, uh, we had a couple of very strange emergency in COVID. The one was a perforation of a ascending colon in a sort of uh, OGV dilation of the colon. I don't know if this is uh, a problem on uh, the therapy on of ventilation, but uh, we had this, and uh, as far as I've seen in uh, very, um, very uh, little and very short uh, literature review, I couldn't find uh, anything yet in this uh, sense. And and we've had we have a lot of questions on this. Are you still performing laparoscopic procedures, or have you stopped this because of the threat of error? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, uh, this really goes out as well to Antonino and Professor uh, Castoro. Have you, are you performing laparoscopic procedures, or have you abandoned this because of the risk of aerosolization virus? Yeah, but we. So uh, the current situation here is we stopped completely since the beginning all elective non-oncologic surgery. We continue to do oncologic surgery, reducing the number of cases with something like a triad and, and uh, if, whenever possible, delaying surgery. So, for example, after new adjuvant treatment, we need to operate after uh, a number of weeks so we can delay surgeries sometimes in these cases and uh, all the patients whenever possible are uh, so we address to, to other mainly new adjuvant solution whenever possible but we're still doing at least 60 percent of the routine oncological surgery we used to do. Uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I've been, I'm very impressed by that. I mean, we yeah. had to stop all of us here, and so that's impressive that you're able to. We, we are acting as a hub for oncologic surgery for the region, so we can't stop it. And can you give us, a, can you give us an idea of how you are making decisions about risk when you are deciding when to offer surgical treatment for patients with cancer? Can you describe your your current protocol if you have one? Right. So I'm 
obviously all emergency cases, bleeding cancer, obstructing cancers are obvious emergency. In, for us also patients already that have already completed new adjuvant treatment that there's not there's no other option than going on with surgery unless they have a complete clinical response of the new adjuvant treatment. That's for upper GI. Yes, yeah, for upper GI. You you go on with surgery. Yeah. So lower GI have specific challenges obviously due to the uh, obstructive symptoms. Uh, what we have had in order to make uh, because obviously when you have uh, limited resources as OR are right now, there is a, you know, it, it could be discussed whether they could, should go to pancreatic surgery, to liver surgery, to colorectal or upper GI or whatever. So uh, we tried in order to, you know, to solve this discussion, uh, we tried to make a prioritization of, uh, code of the oncologic cases that was received uh, also by the region, uh, the governmental, uh, the government of, of Lombardy, in which uh, the cases, as mentioned by Carlo, the cases that were uh, that are um, heavily symptomatic, oncologic. I'm talking only about oncologic cases yeah. that are heavily symptomatic and that cannot have an alternative treatment because that's also an important criterion, and also that. Um, have uh, less uh, need for intensive care, they should prioritize, every, be yeah. prioritize everywhere. The ones who need intensive care, according to a, um, a recent uh, a decree of, uh, of the region, they have, theoretically, they could have, uh, they could be allocated in this oncologic hub that they identified into four hospitals among us among which us. Okay, uh, so that's interesting. We have um, uh, a similar approach in the UK, at least we've been instructed to prioritize patients into threes. The first, I think there's one A and one B and two and three, and, and effectively, for the if they don't need surgery within 12 weeks, we're being told to cancel. Right. Uh, Absolutely. So I'm just gonna keep asking questions because I want to try and get through as many. I'm sorry if they perhaps jump through topics but they're coming up as they come so again with in terms of your um, management of acute conditions like appendicitis has there been any consensus about how you consider when to use antibiotics and when you would be more conservative for, uh, for treat treatment of these sorts of diseases we do we don't we treat them normally so, so no 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 there was a question also uh, on laparoscopic uh, uh, indication. Uh, we do laparoscopy uh, with no no problem. I think that uh, in humanitas also they do the same approach as in uh, standard period. We do. Can you, yeah. can, you, can you elaborate on the level of protection that you wear when you're performing both um, well, when you're performing surgery, have you changed the way that you scrub and protect yourself? So uh, there is a there is a protocol for no COVID positive patients that uh, that is also very easily found on the CDC website as uh, you can right. find it there and this is uh, really easy to okay. follow. But the problem is what to do with all the rest. In a pandemic where you really don't know and you can't exclude that a patient that you have to operate on is actually COVID negative, and uh, therefore, theoretically, some some uh, recommendation have uh, some societies have recommended to wear full equipment, as in endoscopy, for example, as for upper GI endoscopy has been proposed. But this is not doable in our setting, at least, even if we. Uh, all work in big centers, but still it's not doable because there is a limitation in the availability of personal protection equipment. Therefore, uh, and according to what all of the major societies have then uh, elaborated in their guidelines that uh, have come out within the recent, uh, the, the last couple of days, um, we decided uh, to that it is sufficient to have uh, standard personal protection, that means 
goggle, uh, goggles and uh, obviously double gloving and uh, and um, and uh, um, standard uh, equipment and the cone. Sorry. So I just wanted to say something on the Professor Rosati uh, case that he found uh, this perforation. I would just wanted to say that if the patient was on IL, anti, anti IL6, uh, uh, there had been, which has been used in a rheumatological disorder before, um, this has been actually associated with two cases of patients who died by perforation of sweet cheese colon perforation. That was described by this. I don't know if that's the case, but I just want to point out that one of the antiviral drugs un uh, that are used is associated, uh, is known to be associated with two cases of death in the registration trials. That, that's extremely important, and thank you so much for raising that. Um, I think that raises the, the, the very significant importance of um, our ability to capture data during this pandemic so that we can alert surgeons to these sorts of events. And I know that there is a COVID surge trial and we have a trial setting up as well. And I will talk about those at the end. So thank you for raising that. I, I want to just ask some further questions and perhaps Professor Rosotti, you could, uh, you could help with this. We have a question from Joen Hao Chan, who's speaking to us from Edinburgh. He, this, he says, what is, the, what is the role for medical students in a climate like this when you have a very stretched environment? Are you employing junior staff and medical students in your hospital? No, uh, we are we have uh, allowed uh, on a voluntary basis just the residents to help in the COVID department. The medical students are completely sent out from the university area, from the campus. Uh, they are just linked uh, via web for lessons and exams, but uh, no, no place in, inside the hospital. Uh, for the residents, uh, residents, they still are uh, working and on a voluntary, voluntary basis, they can be employed under the supervision of the senior staff uh, in the COVID area. Thank you. And um, I also have another question here from Ruben De Klein. Thank you for your question. What is your hospital regional or national policy for transferring patients to other hospitals if they need surgery, if they're COVID positive or negative? Have you had to transfer anybody? Not yet, but uh, if the situation uh, will not change, probably we will. Uh, from uh, up to this moment, we had accepted patients from other hospitals, and this was happening till last Monday, and we had accepted many patients, as I told you, from the Bergamo area, which is yeah. the, the area much involved uh, but Milano is running, running very fast to the same situation. And, um, but if, if things will not change uh, locally, uh, I mean, we will decide uh, on uh, Monday and Tuesday after the opening of the new 24 beds, as I told you, if this can, um, can free some uh, internal uh, resources from the nursing department and from the anesthesiology department uh, for us to keep at least uh, four or five operating rooms uh, uh, all day long for the uh, internal uh, necessity because we have uh, not only GI, liver, pancreas, we have uh, urology with a very, very strong list we have neurosurgeon, oncologic neurosurgeon with a very strong list. So there are a, a, a number of specialties that, that needs to, to, to find the situation. So if, if we could uh, overcome the problem with this uh, new stuff, uh, it's okay. Otherwise, we will have to see uh, how, how things will be going. 
We've just had a question. Um, how do, how have you and your team changed your working patterns as the situation has evolved? And how have you built resilience into your teams? <laughs> so, this is a good question, actually. Yeah. This is a really good question. So, Professor Castoro was the he yeah. most heavily <laughs> yes. hit among all I, of yeah. us because... Uh, I'm the only survived to the yeah. because of mom. So he, on my units. So. Yeah, not survive. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> they don't survive yes, but they are affected. Well, yeah. <laughs> and no, in, in, so he, he is in a special situation um, and uh, will have our support. But for, uh, for the colorectal team, for example, I decided to split into two teams. So we, uh, the activity starting from next week will be completely split and one team will uh, will uh, stay home while the other team will come in the hospital and do the job because we have, as Professor Rosati mentioned, we also have um, uh, reduced, uh, very much reduced uh, OR in comparison to our standards. So uh, that half of the team is able to keep the work and, uh, and provide that the rest of the team will be spared in case of uh, occasional uh, contagion because that's obviously important if we want to guarantee uh, to go on at least with uh, those few cases that really uh, should be done even in uh, such a situation. Can you give us a sense of the degree of burnout in your staff and how are staff um, keeping themselves together under the immense uh, strain which we know that you are facing? You know, you know you, we are Latins. So burnout is not is not in our courts. <laughs> this is one thing. Yeah. But really, really, surgeon surgeons at the moment I, I, yeah. I, are not at the moment are yeah. not uh, burning out here because they actually are very enthusiastic to yeah. to you know to you know adrenaline not enthusiastic but adrenaline that's the right word yeah. to help and keen to help. But uh, and even be uh, available to change their usual work right. in order to help others, and this is the main message because we have to be flexible in front of this. We have to, you know, to leave our comfort zone, and uh, and everyone, especially the younger ones, I have to say that we're extremely, extremely um, prone and uh, keen to help. And uh, when yeah. all of our teams dedicated part of the staff to assist the pneumological uh, or COVID positive patients in the world, not in the ICU for yes. competency, but on, on the world. Right. And most of the staff uh, of the surgeon, the surgical staff are rotating in the high dependency ward. Yeah. And in the low dependency ones are rotating orthopedics or urologists, so staff less trained to take care of, uh, of uh, severely ill patients. It's really encouraging to hear, and I'm very pleased to hear that your teams are, 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 are in good mental shape. Uh, a recurrent question that we're having, we've had a number of different people ask this question, um, is should all patients going for surgery uh, have testing beforehand? And if so, what would be the best test? Well, the sensibility of the test is too low to... to, to make a triage on this basis. So the discussion today is to perform a CT scan, a lung CT scan, as a standard of diagnosis of suspected COVID-19 infection. So what we will probably, we're still not doing, but from next week, possibly, it will be mandatory to, to perform a CT scan before surgery, before elective surgery, oncologic surgery. No, not only uh, for suspect infection, I think for major surgery, also with asymptomatic patients, because yeah, what, yes. what, what we found was uh, in, in a couple of patients coming from, as I told you, other areas, totally asymptomatic, no fever, no PCR, no nothing on the blood test and uh, with a horrible CT scan. Yeah, this was suggested for all the patients undergoing oncologic surgery. Now. That's an excellent piece of advice, which we will, I'll tell you what we will do after this webinar, we will write up the whole webinar and publish this and the videos will all be available to watch on the website and we're also going to 
uh, have our partners at Touch Surgery going to distribute the, the, the video as well. So all this learning will be collated. Um, I suppose we've had a number of different questions on a similar theme. Are your surgeons being asked to practice outside of their area of speciality? So, for example, some of our surgeons in the UK are being asked to train to go to intensive care or to even work in other specialities. Has this been something you have been asked to do? Yes, at yes. this moment on a voluntary basis, uh, I have one of the senior uh, staff, uh, senior member of my staff that uh, asked to go on for two months in the COVID uh, uh, emergency department. And it, it would be, of course, under the direction of uh, someone uh, more uh, expert than himself in, in doing this, but uh, on a, just at this moment on a voluntary basis, we will see on the next day if we will be still voluntary. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I agree. In our center, it was as well semi-voluntary because they yeah. asked they asked uh, us as a department of surgery to provide uh, at least five people that could uh, help because there is already the need in order to open new worlds. Why there is this need? I want to make this clear because. We have the same problem in, uh, in, as Professor Rosati with, about the shortage of anesthesiologists and nurses for opening new ICU beds. But when you open uh, even COVID wards, why doesn't is not enough to have those uh, reallocate those uh, physicians that were already taking care of the patients in the ward? The reason is because the shifts are being rearranged because you uh, working with the equipment that you need to have for COVID positive patients is extremely fatiguing. You cannot drink, you cannot eat, you cannot uh, go to the toilet. And, and therefore, we rearrange the, the shifts into six hour shifts instead of eight hours. So that means that we need more people. Yeah, and all the staff is trained in the simulation center before entering a new, starting a new activity in the world. Uh, that's, well, that's very different and that's not happening here at the moment. Um, but that seems to be um, a very novel approach. Um, in terms of um, just so that we can get a sense of how busy you are and what the outcomes are like, can you can you give uh, perhaps um, you could give us a sense of how many cases you've had to treat and what the mortality is at the moment in the hospitals that you are working in? So um, I can say that. Um, regarding the mortality and regarding the number of patients that we are getting. So yeah. the inpatient uh, uh, outside of the ICU uh, was uh, like three days ago was about 110. And I think that today probably reached uh, with the opening this afternoon of a new world with 40 new beds will arrive to about 160. That's about the number of beds outside of the ICU. As said, our ICUs uh, was at, at the beginning, as in uh, San Rafaele Hospital, uh, we, were, uh, we had different ICUs at the beginning for cardio, for neuro and whatever. So outside of these, now we only have one uh, operative block that is, uh, that is dedicated to general ICU. And uh, then there is another one, another ICU that is for stroke and everything else is for, for, um, for COVID patients, including two OR blocks that are completely dedicated to these and do not function anymore as operating no. rooms. And they, now we are, uh, if we have um, during the weekend, the full implementation, we will have 48, 48 ICU, ICU beds, beds in the hospital uh, yeah. for COVID outside for, of for the COVID. others. We started from four on 23rd of February. And uh, the mortality rate you asked, intra-hospital yeah. mortality rate, in our hospital of the patients who yeah. get admitted is between, every day between 9.8 and 11 yeah. percent mortality. It's around 10 percent the average in, in our hospital, but it's uh, almost 20 percent in other hospitals in the region. In Bergamo it's 20 yeah. percent. What, what I want to point out is that from the beginning there was a very strong regional coordination between ICU units and they get together every day also to, to share resources, obviously. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, uh, in, at the end of February, 
in the region, there were 720 ICU beds. That means around eight per uh, 10, uh, mm. uh, under, uh, 400,000 hospital beds. And uh, uh, so, sorry, 400,000 uh, people. And now from 720, we are 1.2, 1,200. Yeah. The capacity was completely but it's expanding, it's still expanding, expanding along. Yeah, it's, expanding. it's exhausting just listening to it. I, it makes me very anxious about what we're going to need to achieve here in the UK in a very short period of time. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of questions, and I just want to try and get through as many as we can in the next seven minutes before we have to, um, before we have to finish. Uh, Mike Kelly has asked us about what are your plans for your trainees? Because w our trainees effectively have had their training completely interrupted. They've effectively been now pulled into full-time um, COVID, they're not. So what have you done uh, locally in, in Milan to try and address your training concerns? Professor Rosati, are you, are you able to comment on that? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the trainees are, um, the, the ones that are still on surgery have, of course, a reduced activity and uh, it's very difficult to say what they could do uh, because the situation is absolutely evolving. We don't know. As I told you, till last uh, Monday, it was uh, reduced, but still a very heavy activity. It's yeah. just on the last four days that uh, it has been very, almost quiet not very quiet because we we could add some 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 sur sur surgery still but do you have just go, sorry to jump around this is my questions are not particularly flowing apologies but just to go back to the mortality question do you have a feeling for why your mortality rate is so high is it because these patients are presenting uh, with significant comorbidity is it because they're frail no. and uh, okay, the the more the more the, the 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 death are mainly above seventy five years old, but the very severe patients are also uh, 30, 40, 50, 60. So yes. let's say that three quarter of the death are in patients of seventy five and more. But uh, still, there are many with no comorbidity. And uh, it, it, it's very strange uh, how these patients uh, get uh, a, a sudden deterioration and a very, very quick uh, deterioration of their uh, uh, breathing capacity. Uh, it's, yep. it's very rapid, the evolution. If I can comment on this, uh, that, that's absolutely true, but the numbers are related to inpatients. So yep. around 10 of patients admitted to the hospital, but most patients are outside the hospital. So possibly this number is around three to five to four to five percent, no more. So, okay, One of the most statistics I read in one of the Lancet reviews that came out of Italy was that 20% of your cases are in health workers yeah. and you have high infection rates amongst health workers. Are you seeing severe illness in those health workers compared to the rest of the population? Going back to the numbers, uh, um, at this moment, uh, as I told you, we have uh, 250 patients, 50 intubated. Of the 200, uh, 100 and uh, 100 and something, 130 with CPAP or VPAP, and a minority just uh, uh, in uh, hospitalized, but with no uh, ventilatory support. If I can comment on uh, the COVID-19 infection in health workers, we. We have some numbers. Uh, uh, at the moment in uh, Italy, there are around 2,600 doctors positive for COVID, 15 deaths. And so it is around 6-8% seven, 
of the total number of positive patients. Mm. And in our hospital, it's becoming a problem too, because we have at the moment 61 health workers positive, most of them no symptomatic or, or very with very few symptoms and very few admitted to the hospital. Yeah. I mean, so it's with, not, at the moment. In China, it was 4% of the healthcare yeah. professionals. We have about 8% of the healthcare professionals. So this is the big problem at the moment. And this is what is probably our major advice to you uh, is to protect as much as possible your, your healthcare resources. Because what, happened in, what is happening in Bergamo is actually that they have a huge problem in covering uh, from the, both the medical as well as the nursing uh, side, the, the words and the, the work and the shift. I'm going to, we've had so many questions. The response to you guys has been amazing. Uh, and I wish I could ask them all, but I think we'd be here for many more hours. So I'm going to finish on the last one, which is from Sharif Haki. He seems like a good guy. It says, we here in the UK are a couple of weeks behind you in this pandemic. Is there anything that you would have done differently that we could learn from you to avoid the situation from evolving as it has in Italy? He says, we salute you and we stand, and I see your battle against this pen. Uh, we salute you and we stand with you in this battle. Now, what would you tell us? Well, the, the first is the, do not underestimate the risk and do anything you, you can for protect your healthcare workers from the beginning. Absolutely. The, the most dangerous areas are the non-COVID-19 areas. Because at the moment, we do not see any, any COVID positive among uh, anesthesiologists, but we see among surgeons in the safest area possible. So uh, this is one. And the second thing is, Try to separate physically all the clean area of the hospital and surgery from the possibly uh, positive uh, contaminated areas. That will uh, save a lot of time and, uh, and also resources. And, and Professor Rosati, last word to you. Is there anything that you would say in response to that question? Uh, I totally agree on what I said, uh, even uh, if uh, also in clean area we will find uh, occasionally COVID patients uh, that were uh, under-evaluated. So uh, we should uh, uh, almost um, do as we did for uh, AIDS patients. So consider all the patients possibly positive and take all the measures that you need to, to have if the patient is positive. So in that case, you don't, uh, you don't uh, lose. Second is, uh, the, the, you, you say that if we were now 15 days back, what can we do? It's to strengthen uh, as much as we can the that people to stay home, don't move, don't go in pubs, don't go in, so do the contrary of what Boris Johnson said. Okay, we, we were going to try and keep this apolitical. <laughs> it's very <laughs> out of pubs, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> but, but, I mean, yes, uh, we, we joke, but I couldn't agree with you more, and this is the advice that certainly we're, we're giving. Uh, it's the, the, the advice that we've had across, you know, the from the Public Health England has been has been controversial, but I, I don't really want to go into that today. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Listen, what I do want to do though is because our hour is up, is I just cannot thank you enough. Um, your wisdom is unbelievably valuable, and I have to say, incredibly sobering. And um, we will take this video. We will post it on our website. Uh, like I said, I really want to thank our colleagues at Touch Surgery. They saved us today when things were going pear-shaped, and we owe them. We'll distribute this video again through their platform. We will create um, the slides that Professor Spinelli has said. We will post on the website, and we will make freely available. That's at pansurge.org, uh, and everything will be there to share. Please use the forums. Please start communicating. 
please communicate with us and tell us what you want to hear next from these future webinars. Um, I'm just going to ask my tech support, support monkey to see, are you able to show up the screen from the other thing? So just before we sign off, we're going to just, we, I'm, we may not be able to do it, we'll try now. So it's just to show you, um, this is the PanSearch platform. Uh, as I said, www.pansearch.org. And um, we have several studies recruiting there, and we would really like to have your support and help uh, with those studies. So um, at the moment, what that means is, um, please just register on the website platform. And there's more information that you can be gained there. Uh, the next talk that we have uh, will be on Monday, yep. I believe. Yeah, yep. please come to the next slide. We'll have some further speakers also coming to us from Italy. Now is the time to ask your questions. If you want specific um, uh, topics to be covered, please do ask us. Um, I'm very grateful for you sticking with us whilst we've had a few technical glitches. This is the first time we've run. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, it will become smoother as we continue. Um, again, thank you to my speakers. I wish you um, um, the best of luck in the coming weeks. Please stay safe. I very look forward to being with you again soon. Uh, and um, again, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, hope to see you in good health. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I couldn't say that um, with, with more passion. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.